I've, I've done a little bit of uh, exploration into these uh, titles and stations that were used for the Olia, and again we find uh, that the certain titles that have been used for the Olia, such as Abdal uh, or Ontad, you know, the uh, substitutes or tent pegs, as it's translated, can be found <clears throat> in, you know, again, the works of the Imams of Ahl Bayt or else their progeny uh, as well. So, again, these terms are not exclusive to the Sunni Sufi tradition. They are appearing in uh, quite early on, you know, produced du'as and ziyarats uh, in the Ithnashri tradition as well. So just to go back to the stations um, of the Awliya, so we find that Hakim Tirmidhi, who travelled from Khorasan, went down to Mecca, came back from Mecca, went up to Iraq, after he uh, comes to Iraq, he then produces this book on uh, Walaya, and he's also then writing about the grades and stations of uh, these awliya. So he says that they have different grades, and he calls these grades darajat. And he says, when one of them dies, God replaces him with a wali of the same status. So a similar doctrine can be found in the Imam's teaching. Imam Sadiq says, Ali salam was a man of knowledge, and knowledge is inherited. And a man of knowledge never dies unless another one remains after him who knows his knowledge. Imam Reza salam confirms this by explicitly using the term Imam to say that when one Imam dies, another one is divinely appointed. Hakim Tirmidhi, a major figure in the establishment of Sufi doctrines, was born between uh, 820 and 824, just a few years after the birth of Muhammad al-Taqi, the ninth Imam. This is another thing we find that really <clears throat> a lot more work needs to be done on this, is that when we're looking at these histories of, of the emergence of Sufism, um, there isn't, a, there's very little work, comparative work that's done to see, you know, what was going on with this emergence of this tradition in relation to the Imams, because they were parallel, they were side by side. Uh, and, and actually, when you start to join up the dots, okay, this was this Imam and this was this, you know, particular figure, uh, then a whole lot of other questions come up. Where did he stand politically? Okay, that was meant to be the Imam of his time, and so what, what was he doing? What was his position with regard to the Imam of the time? Especially someone such as Hakim Timurthy, who's writing on Walaya. Um, so he died in 892, approximately 20 years after the martyrdom of the 11th Imam, salam, who it is said notified 40 reliable Shiites as to whom would be the 12th Imam's representative. He informed them that they would not see him again and commanded them to obey Uthman ibn Sa'id. So we've got this number 40, you know, 40 people being appointed or, you know, given some uh, particular. Uh, initiation or information, uh, this becomes, you know, uh, a, a status of the awliya in this hierarchy of awliya, and yet we find also in the imami tradition, uh, according to uh, the sources that the 11th imam, you know, again appointed, you know, 40 reliable uh, people. At the age of 27, uh, sometime after Mutawakkil, had had the 10th Imam, Imam al-Naqi brought from Medina to Baghdad, Tirmidhi made his Hajj, traveling from Tirmidh, Khorasan to Basra and then on to Mecca. He then went back to Basra in search of traditions. After his Tawbah in Mecca, he returned to Iraq and went in search of books, this is according to you know, his account, for knowledge. However, according to his account, his account, he remained bewildered until the teachings of the people of knowledge of God reached my ears. And he calls these people Ahl, uh, Ahl al-Ma'rifah. So he comes across these Ahl al-Ma'rifah who have, you know, stopped him from being bewildered. But he doesn't say who these Ahl al-Ma'rifah are. Apart from one person who he mentions, which is Mahasabi. You can find an account of Mahasabi in Michael Sell's book, um, uh, early early Sufism, it's not early Sufism, something like that, um, but it's by Michael Sells, he's the editor and he's got a chapter on Mahasadi and Mahasadi's method as one of the early uh, Oliya. Okay, so 
Timothy mentions Mahasati as one of his teachers, but uh, doesn't really mention anyone else. According to his own claims, Timothy's claims, the rest of his knowledge appears to come from dreams. Overlooking the fact that Timothy was in Iraq during the 11th Imam's imprisonment in the north at Samarra, Ahmed Karamustafa concludes that since Tirmidhi does not appear to have spent time in Lower Iraq, although as can be seen Tirmidhi himself says that he passed through Basra, or he was not with the Sufis of Baghdad, then he must have developed his thought by himself. Okay. So Ahmed Karamustafa is a Turkish you know, contemporary scholar writing on Sufism. You can find you know, his books and accounts of the history of Sufism. And so he's come to the conclusion that because Tirmidhi apparently wasn't in southern Iraq, maybe where a lot of the Shia were, uh, then he must have come up with his doctrines on his own. Uh, even though the records say that uh, already that there probably would have been Shia in the north because the 11th Imam was imprisoned in the north as well. Yet it is known, okay, so Tirmidhi's meant to have come up with these doctrines on his own. Um, but he was aware enough of the Imami school and its doctrines to write polemical treatises against the Rawafid. So he knows about these Imami doctrines, he's writing treatises against the Rawafid, um, but he has come up with his own book on Walaya, and our contemporary historians on Sufism are saying, well, he came up with this doctrine on his own. Um, as mentioned above, many Shi'i doctrines and concepts can be found in Sufi works without any attributions given. For example, since Tirmidhi is silent about the origin of his knowledge, he is credited with the visionary conception of the states and stations through which the soul passes in order to attain the station of Walaya, apparently using terms that are not found among other Sufis. So this is another thing when you're reading contemporary uh, works on uh, the history of Sufism, you'll find that some scholars are saying that this person was the first person to come up with this term, this person came up with it by themselves, because they haven't actually investigated the works of the Imams of Ahl Bayt. Um, as an example, um, in Tirmidhi's uh, usage, uh, Vanazil correspond more or less to the Ahwal and Maqamat of the classical books of Sufism meeting, meaning halting stations. So, you know, we have these stations and states you know, that the soul passes through in order to attain ma'rifah. Uh, these are usually called ahwal and maqamat. Uh, but Tirmidhi uses the term manzil. So we can see that Imam Zain Labadin, as, as an example, uses the term manzil some 150, 200 years earlier than Tirmidhi. In the first du'a of Sahifa Sajjadiyya, he says, Praise belongs to God, a praise through which he will illuminate for us the shadows of the interworld, the barzakh, ease for us the path of resurrection, and raise up our stations, manazilina, as the standing places of the witnesses. Imam al-Sadiq approximately 100 years before Timurthi uses manzil. He says the imams are of the station, manzil, of the Messenger of Allah, except that they are not prophets. Tirmidhi incidentally replicates this teaching with regard to the awliya. It says in his Sirat al-Awliya, which has been translated into uh, English, the student asked him, and what is the description of the friend who possesses the imamat of the friendship with God, as well as the leadership and the seal of friendship with God? He replies, he is very close in rank to the prophets. In fact, he has almost attained their status. So Timothy is saying, the awliya Allah, <clears throat> you know, are of a similar rank to the prophet, just as Imam al-Sadiq has said, you know, the imams are of a similar rank to the prophet. So this is just one instance of terminology, concepts, and doctrines migrating from works and words of the imams to the works and words of pioneering Sufis who wrote works against the Rawafid. Um, I will just uh, skip ahead um, over some of these doctrines as we are, are running out of time. Um, there's just something that I will highlight at the end. Um, yeah, so uh, what we find happening is 
in a nutshell, is that we have this concept of wilaya developing among the imams uh, and their their followers and you know the scholars who followed them. Around the ninth century, in the minor occultation, um, we find that wilaya, this idea of wilaya, starts to spread in Sunni circles and is used as the foundation of Sufism. Um, and you know we have this idea of the awliya, Allah being the guardians of, of humanity, the guardians of right guidance. You know it's obligatory to follow them. And then we find another twist, which is that this idea of wilaya in the Sunni Sufi tradition gets incorporated back into the Shi'i tradition. Um, so I will just uh, conclude with this uh, example. Um, as has been uh, seen from studying the available hadith, the Imams recognize the awliya because through their jihad and nafs they have attained the station of yaqeen and annihilated their selves and the attributes of the divine reality. Through their victory over their selves and through their wayfaring, they merit to be held as teachers and as people to be followed. In the kernel of the kernel, such a theory seems to have inadvertently been attached to the Imams themselves. So, um, you know, the standard uh, Sufi pattern is that we go through the Jihad al Nas, which consists of certain uh, stations, and you know, you progressively get higher, you overcome your lower nafs, uh, the attributes of your lower nafs, and you attain uh, Yaqeen. Uh, and then we find uh, Tehrani writing about, not other Tehrani, but another Tehrani, um, writing um, with regard to. Uh, Imam Ali and Imam Zayn al-Abidin where he says, and this is in the kernel of the kernel, where he says, those religious leaders and spiritual guides, may God's greetings be upon them all, had passed beyond the stages of wayfaring towards God, had entered into his sanctuary, and subsequently had attained the station of subsistence after annihilation, baqa ba'd al-fana. Passing through, and of course beyond, the stages of wayfaring entails first having to overcome al-nafs al-amar al-bisul, the soul that commands to evil. Nor could any imam have attained the station of baqa, for such a situation implies that he was not at that station previously. Obedience to an imam is not obligatory because he has struggled through all of the precarious stages of the nafs, and has subsequently attained the station of baqa. Obedience is obligatory because he has always been and always will be at this station. Abu Abdullah salam, said the Hajja was there before the creatures, is there together with the creatures and will be there after the creatures. So obedience to the Wali on the other hand may be recommended based on the fact that he has attained victory after struggling through all the stages of the nafs. According to Shi'i doctrine, the Ma'asumin were created as such in the realm of pre-existence. A questioner asked Imam al Hussein, What were you before the creation of Adam? And he replied, We were silhouettes of light revolving around the throne of the All-Merciful. And we taught praise, the formula of unicity and glorification to the angels. This idea has found its way into the doctrines of the Tijani order, which are based upon the works of, Imam, uh, of uh, Ibn Arabi, where uh, it is said the seal of the saints uh, was uh, a saint and informed of his sanctity when Adam was between water and clay. Um, except that uh, other, saints, uh, other saints after him um, Sorry, I had the translation of the English there in my, in my notes. Um, basically to say that um, all other saints that come after this saint that was created in the realm, realm of pre-existence take their sanctity from him. So, you know, the seal of the saints was created as the seal of the saints in the realm of pre-existence um, when Adam was between water and clay and all other awliya that, you know, that come after him have taken their waliyah from the uh, 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 awliya, or the seal of the saints. The reversal in status is clear in examining the above texts. Tehrani, a Shi'i, has implied that the Imam must go through all the stages of the Jihad al-Nafs in order to fulfill the conditions of Walaya. 
While Ahmed Tijani, a Sunni, has made it clear that the Khatm al awliya who he believed himself was, incidentally, it's a whole other topic on awliya believing themselves to be Khatm al awliya was created as such in the realm of pre existence. So we have a reversal here. 20th century Shi'i scholars saying the Imams have gone through all the stages of the jihad, jihad on nafs, you know, and they've attained this station, and this is why we're following them. And Sunni uh, Sufis saying that, well, actually, our awliya were created as such in the realm of pre existence. They always were that, and they always will be that. So, in conclusion, it may be seen that the Sunni Sufi tradition appropriated for itself certain dimensions of authority that in the Shi'i tradition, were reserved exclusively for the Imam and they attached him to the awliya. Awliya who often did not recognize the Imam's wilaya. In the Shi'i tradition, the awliya were those who had indeed attained a level of perfection and the Imams thus recommended seeking them out and keeping company with them. However, these awliya have not been given any absolute authority over the Shi'i. What appears to have happened, however, is that with the gradual adoption of Sunni Sufism into the Shi'i tradition, certain doctrines with regard to the authority of the awliya have likewise been adopted, including that of the wali's spiritual authority over the Shi'i and the wali as the only way towards annihilation in the divine names and attributes. What this spiritual authority means in practice, however, remains undefined. Mm -hmm.